Don. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you, Duncan, for inviting me. And believe me, it was no effort to come there to hold uh, Bruce and Merlin, who live in one of the most beautiful parts of this area, as well, the Tambo River. So we got there last night, and the sunset was just just a dream. So, look, book lovers, good evening. Lovely to see you here. Oh, well, it's been a character testing day. <laughs> you all survived the heat, which is wonderful. Uh, so it's nice to see you here tonight. Uh, to those of you who've already um, bought my book, thank you. Tales from the Political Trenches. Uh, uh, Berlin, thank you for kicking off the, the marketing here in, in this region. Uh, but it's um, this is the first book that I have, I have written. I, I don't know if I'd do another one, certainly not like this. Uh, anyone here written a book? Right. Authors here, yeah. Oh, Jill's putting her hand up. Journalist, I know. Yeah. Well, certainly, I, I found um, uh, with I got halfway into it. I, I guess I've been a journalist all my life, as you know, but never really written anything more than about four or five thousand words. Um, this is uh, it comes in about eighty five thousand. I got halfway through and had that crisis of doubt. You know, is anyone going to read this? <laughs> and but you're so far in, you just got to keep going and keep going on. Well, look, I'm, I'm thrilled to say, and I'll pay for this boast, but it's done extremely well. My publishers, Melbourne University Press, are just stoked because they tell me it's the, the top of the political bestseller lists. And it's very hard to sell, you know, political books in this country. They usually average about three, 5,000. We look as if we're going to do about 16,000 this by Christmas, which is fantastic. Um, And, well, no, I have to say, no, no, I'll come to that, no, I have to say, the former <laughs> Prime Minister has really zoomed up the charts, but, you know, I mean, he was in politics for 33 years. <laughs> um, but um, I was thrilled in the first couple of weeks uh, on the, uh, the non-fiction list. I came in at, at number two. Uh, I couldn't believe this the first couple. Can anyone tell me what number one was on the non-fiction list? Have a guess. What do you think number one was? Chat very good. Jamie Oliver's 15 minute meals. <laughs> now I couldn't compete with that, but I was I was with a group a couple of weeks ago and a, and a lady said, just add a few recipes with the next edition. <laughs> so look, with or with or without recipes, I'm thinking about that if we do a reprint. Um, I hope you I hope you find it uh, a, a good read. I I guess I was wanting to to write this book because we've been through a very, very dramatic time in Australian politics, have we not? And my time in politics was intense but exceptionally brief. Uh, it is absolutely true that I, I went out and I beat a Prime Minister in 2007, only uh, the second person to do so in Australian history. But unfortunately, and it's a great matter of regret, I was not able to hold on to that seat in the, the tumultuous election of 2010. And believe me, folks, writing about your defeat is a hell of a lot harder than writing about your successes. Um, I, mean, I just kind of zoomed through the chapter of Bill on Win, and it has a, if you read it, it has a vibrancy and a buoyancy about it. But obviously, when you, you knuckle down and you think, well, you have to be quite reflective and I have to face up to my, my own mistakes as well. Why is it that I couldn't hold on to the seat? And uh, it's. Um, uh, as I say, it was the, the hardest chapter to write and obviously reflects my, my disappointments. But I wanted to reflect back, as I say, on a period that's been quite extraordinary. Uh, the removal of a first term Prime Minister, which has never happened. And of course, the, um, the very disappointing election of 2010, which left really Labor clinging to, um, to minority government. And as I write in the book, uh, uh, I think in spite of um, certainly a lot of good policy initiatives and considerable legislative success, successes in spite of minority status. I do think it is left Labor looking as if it is very reactive, often looking as if it's in the business of survival, not in the business of being a proactive reform government. And I start, you know, I start the book with an opening chapter, uh, which is an extended conversation with Paul Keating. I haven't got too many heroes, um, but uh, Keating, I guess, comes closest uh, to it for me. He's a, he's a most engaging individual, and any, any of you who've actually met him will know that, uh, uh, that that is so. It doesn't always come across in his, his public persona. But I went to see him about this time last year because I was thinking about, as I say, writing about this period. 
And I wasn't sure if I had a book in me or if it was just a long essay. And I sat down with Paul Keating in his, in his Pot Point, Potts Point office. And, and of course, I, I reminded him that uh, immediately after the win in Benelong, he called me, as a lot of people were, but I particularly remember, of course, Keating's conversation. And he got on the phone to me on the, the Monday after November 24, 2007. And he said a lot of things, some of which are completely unrepeatable. <laughs> certainly unrepeatable. You can imagine he was pretty stoked that I'd beaten his nemesis, right? But he said to me, he said, now look, remember this, when you get to Canberra, it's a contest of ideas. You got that? He said, it's a contest of ideas. Paul always repeats himself twice, just in case you get it. Now, I didn't have to wrestle with this because it was entirely in line with my own thinking. And it's part of what was had motivated me to get involved in politics because I believe that public life matters. And in spite of the disappointments of Reba over recent years, I still believe that. I am not cynical about, uh, about politics and I never have been. I never was as a journalist. I mean, wherever I have worked, I have tried to gravitate towards where political uh, sorry, really, the intellectual energy is. But you know, when I got to Canberra, I found that hard to find. And it's not because the place isn't full of bright people, because it is. It is full of bright people. It's full of people who are conscientious and incredibly energetic. And 99% of them are there for the right reason, because they want to serve. But as I say in my book, I believe that we've now got to a point where actually the political culture in conjunction with the media culture operates in such a way that contestability around ideas is really squashed. And that as a new government, as excited as we were that Labor was back in office after the long Howard years, we were so consumed with busyness and doorstops and announceables and point scoring on Sky News were you know, absolutely still in campaign mode where we needed to switch to, uh, if you like, I think a more sensible governing mode. But this contest of ideas um, was not always there. And I think the government, and I think it's still true from this more recent period, has suffered um, as, as a result of that. And when I look back, because I had a long period as a political journalist, I can make the comparison if you consider, we're here at the five-year mark in terms of Labor's period in office this time around, I think it's fair to say, as I say, in spite of many good things, most Australians would still struggle to identify what the key distinguishing features are of this period in office. I mean, what is it that defines this period? Now, by contrast, I look back at the Paul Keating period, and at the five-year mark, in spite of a very different, difficult external Nonetheless, I think it was very, very clear what the key defining characteristics were. Most people understood what the government was about, and that was the liberalising of the Australian economy underpinned by a strong, targeted social safety net. I mean, I was in the United States for part of the, the 80s, but I came back at the end of the 80s, uh, was working in Canberra, and I remember that every taxi driver was so well informed on the state of the economy. This is because of the kind of advocacy of Paul McKeating. The taxi drivers could talk to you about the terms of trade. It was also a time when I have to say most taxi drivers knew where they were going. <laughs> Sorry, this is an aside. I'm an old, I'm now sufficiently senior I can say this. It doesn't matter whether it's Brisbane, Sydney or Canberra, these days most taxi drivers need to say to you, do you know where you're going? <laughs> Sorry, just an aside. So they were, they were very different times. And I just think we are the poorer because of that. As I say, because there's not this clear definition. And our leaders are not um, explaining to us or taking the time, the sustained advocacy, as I say in the book, um, to explain what it is they are doing. It's as if our leaders, and this is true on both sides of politics, are treating the electorate as if they're a bunch of 10-year-olds. And if there is disquiet and unease in the electorate, and there is, um, and I, I sense this from all sorts of groups that I've been talking to in the last you know, six, seven weeks. Uh, it's because of this. People are saying we want something better. We actually want to be treated um, like engaged adults. We want a serious political discussion. 
we want to know from, from our political leaders their sense of why they want to take the country. Why it is, you know, or what, what it is they want to do with the power they have. And as you know, we will finish up the political year on an absolute low note. We saw that in the last week of, of the Parliament, and it's, it's been pretty grim. Um, I, um, I'm asked all the time about this. I, I, I fear, I fear it may have to go a bit lower yet. Um, but the optimist in me tells me we're not going to stay, stay stuck in this rut. We are too smart a country. We have um, viable, strong institutions. There's enough talent in the place that I think there will be, uh, if you like, pressure for, and we're already seeing this from business groups, from community groups and others, a good deal of pressure beyond the parliament to say, come on, we demand something better. And of course, we all have a role to play in that. <coughs> So look, there, there's some of the political themes uh, I develop in the book. Um, you could all be, be forgiven, of course, on the basis of the pre-publicity around the book for thinking the whole thing is about the removal of Kevin Rudd. Well, there's one chapter on that called Ambush, and a very compelling, dramatic chapter it is, so I urge you all to read it. Uh, I've just been told, that in fact, it did uh, alter um, somebody's view recently about those events, which is always encouraging here, but I am aware that what I've written um, is, is provocative and it challenges the accepted view that there was kind of a spontaneous uprising of the corpus against this uh, tyrannical run and, um, you know, uh, everyone found, you know, the better senses and uh, changed leaders. I challenge that view. Uh, quite, quite frankly, it's a, it's a fairy tale. And I do think if we are at this point in time, as we are, I believe we are, we are um, there's a brutishness in our public life. Quite frankly, it has a lot to do with the events of June 2010. Why? Because it was an absolute convention breaker. Rudd was given no warning about this. On the night before he was knocked off, his treasurer was in his office having a drink with him, congratulating him on keeping the campaign running against the miners. Now, if you, again, contrast that with uh, what has happened in the past, uh, there's an audience of Victorians, you'll all know well, the, the late John Button. John Button was a very good friend of Bill Haynes. They were very close. When John Button made the most difficult decision of his career to move his support from his good friend Bill Hayden to Bob Hawke on the eve of the 1983 election, he sat down and he wrote Hayden a letter and he set out his reasons. And he also said, it wasn't because he thought Hawke was the best person in the world. He had severe uh, reservations, actually, about some aspects of Hawke's personality. But he said, it is absolutely critical the party wins. Now, I'm not saying there's any particular etiquette about how the leaders are knocked off. But that's what Button did. And then if you fast forward to what Keating did, after Hawke had won election after election, Keating felt obviously, as many of you would know, that he'd been done by the Kirribilli deal. And he went to um, went into Hawke's office. And he said, Bob, I always said I'd tell you when I was going to take you on. Well, I'm here and I'm telling you. So this was the Keating full frontal, you know. Now, uh, as I say, I contrast that with what happened to Rudd. And whatever you think of Rudd's prime ministership, uh, I see this, as I say, as an absolute convention-breaking moment. Another big convention was breached in February this year when we saw a rematch, and some members of the Cabinet uh, felt they had to go public and say very, very <coughs> extreme, quite frankly defamatory, and in my view, quite incorrect things about Rudd's term in office. Now, this is terrible for the Labor Party, because whatever the Labor movement's about, we, we tend to honour our former leaders. And Lindsay Tanner, a critical figure in, 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 in the, and a very central figure in the, in the Rudd government, said much the same thing when he brought his book out two months ago, that, that this was, uh, what was said in February it was wildly exaggerated. He made the point, of course, if you do something as extreme as, you know, basically killing the king, then um, what you see is this extraordinary effort to demonise that individual in order to justify it. So, my book, presents, as I say, something of a, a corrective, if you like, a second draft of history. I take the view there is no one simple truth. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, 
kinds of personalities at the top of the government. There are different uh, versions of events. And I've told a different version of um, events. So as I say, I'll, I'll put that out there um, for you to absorb and, and make you mind up. I'll just um, uh, spend the, just a couple of minutes and before I, I take your questions, just making the point that this book is about a lot of other things as well. Apart from anything else, it's about uh, uh, my own personal story, what motivated me to go into politics, but also how on earth, how on earth it was that I got to the point where I, I had enough in me to actually take on John Howard. I mean, when I sat down to write this book, you know, I, I had to say to myself, it forces you to be reflective, you know, when you sit down to write. You think, what on earth was it in my background that got me to this point, uh, as I say, my, my jumping off the cliff moment? Um, there's a lovely bloke at the back of the room, my bloke, Bob Hogg. He happened to, yeah, um, he happened to say to me one day at the beginning of 2007, as I was headed off for a swim on a hot day like this, you could run for bed along, you know? And, of course, I thought it was crazy and everyone I thought it would think it would be vainglorious and all the rest of it. But you know when an idea plants itself in here, it kind of insinuates itself in, well, it never went away. And, of course, two months later, there I was, you know, putting my hand up, asking for pre-selection for a seat that, believe me, nobody was fighting over the pre-selection of Ben Long. <laughs> believe me, nobody. No senior trade union figure, no prominent figure of the party, nobody. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was wide open. But as I say, I, more than that, I, I looked back over my life and uh, uh, I went back to my, I thought about my schooling, for instance. I was schooled in, I grew up in Brisbane in the days when Brisbane was a, you know, a real sleepy, small town place. And my only ambition as I was growing up there was actually to escape the joint, you know. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I knew there had to be a Bansdale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And, uh, but I, I look back and when I was at All Hallows, it was an all-girls Catholic school, which is a terrific place for me. Uh, no one ever said, no one ever said, the school will grow up take on a Prime Minister and beat him. No one ever said that. They, my mother has kept my school reports and, they, and the reports tended to say things like this. You can always trust the nuns, can't you? Um, they'd say on my reports, Maxine is quite right, but has an inability to concentrate for a little bit of time. <laughs> so I said, funny, funny that I should end up, you know, working in the media, you know, with the short attention spans and all the rest of it, which of course is, is what I did. I had 30 very very happy years in journalism. And, uh, but I did a lot of different things. I, I worked across the states, I worked uh, as a foreign correspondent, I worked on business programs and a political, uh, as a political correspondent as well. And I also wrote very happily for a period for the, um, the uh, recently departed Bulletin magazine uh, and enjoyed that enormously. But of course I got to the point where I really wanted to test myself in, in, in a different way. And as I said right at the beginning, because I believe that public life matters, I've spent a lot of time asking questions, and I thought, well, I'm at the time of my life now, I'd actually like to work on the answers. And, and I'm very glad I did. People often say to me, well, do you regret what happened given the fact that I couldn't keep my seat? Well, no, I don't. It was, it was the experience of a lifetime. I loved working on public policy. I worked in the early childhood area, and then uh, a bit later with Anthony Albanese on infrastructure, and I loved both those areas. They were very, very stimulating. And I also represented a marvellous um, uh, uh, part of North, North Western Sydney in, in Belmont. It's just a terrific constituency of people to, uh, to represent. Uh, but of course, I'll uh, always remember the, the thrill of that night. It wasn't, it wasn't if you like, expected. Um, certainly people on um, the Labor side of politics were uh, eyeing Bill along in a very particular way. I think it gave, the whole campaign gave heart to a lot of people. And I think it's fair to say, though, that most people did not think I could pull it off. The conventional wisdom was that I could perhaps take a percentage point or two off Sean Howard, but that I would pick it up after, you know, running the subsequent by-election. Mind you, that's interesting, because Petro Giorgio, um, the Victorian Liberal, said to me recently, you realise if you hadn't been John Howard in 2007, he'd still be there. He, would, he wouldn't have quit. He would have stayed like Billy McMahon. <laughs> so there you go. History could have been different. But um, uh, the, as I say, the conventional wisdom was that I really would fall short and not win this campaign. But you know what? That was never my thinking. 
I took a lot of advice here in 2007. I had a wonderful campaign team. But I never believed for a moment that I was doing it as some kind of distraction or dress reversal. Because if you think that way, if you think you're going to come in number two, or like, you know, you'll come in number three or four. I set out to win. I really did. And that was absolutely critical to my psychology, my approach. And in turn, other people could see that I was serious about winning. And that in turn attracted a, a huge kind of rainbow coalition of campaigners uh, to the seat. And it was a wonderfully, as I say, buoyant, energising um, experience. Uh, it, it meant that so many people who weren't that politically active um, were really energised by, by that year. And, and of course, so we got to uh, uh, election night. And um, I couldn't quite claim victory, but I went to bed that night knowing um, that I, I certainly had won. And uh, in the days and weeks after, apart from that great phone call from Paul Keating and various others, uh, it was wonderful to hear stories from true believers all around the country about what they thought and what they felt and where they were on election night as they could see that I was beating John Howard. And I'll just leave you with this one lovely story. I was in central Queensland and an elderly man came up to me and said, look, I want to tell you this story, girly. <laughs> no, well, I want to tell you this story. Now, look, when I turned 65, my wife gave me a special present. And it was skydiving lessons. And she thought this was very special. She researched it. She talked to the instructor. Uh, he told her about all the safety aspects. And, you know, I booked a number of uh, lessons and uh, skydives for you. And um, what sealed the deal was the instructor saying to my wife, your husband does this, I guarantee he'll be coming home and saying it's better than sex. <laughs> so, this is my 65th birthday present. Oh, that's fantastic. And I, tell you, I go up in the, the plane and I get togged up and I, I, you know, I take the instruction, you know, jump out, shoot goes up, you know, floating, 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 it's fantastic, you know, land somewhere outside of, you know, Bansdale, it's fantastic. No, not really. Um, and he said, and it was great. And I went home and you know, gave my wife an account of this. And she looked at me. He's no, no, no. It's, you know, six, seven out of ten. Pretty good. But he said, girly, I'm going to tell you, girly, on the night that you're beating John Howard, I'm sitting at home on the sofa with my wife, and you're beating him. And I turn to my wife and I say, now that's better than sex. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that story and many others. <laughs> so look, thank you very much. It's by way of saying that um, look, it's all in here. Love, pain, the whole damn thing, you know. So look, uh, priced wonderfully, under $30. <laughs> Lovely stocking filler. Recommended to all of you. Happy to sign copies. Thank you for coming, everyone. Well, it was, was it one thing? Uh, if I have to, uh, look, was it swing? If I, I suppose you have to say in the, in, the end, in the end, the momentum was there and the swing was there. And when the swing is there, it carries so much before it. And when the swing is the other way, again, uh, that, that explains 2010. Because the, while the swing was not on in Victoria, which you know, we landed very well in Victoria in 2010, but in Sydney, Sydney, we, we had a wipeout of, um, of our vote across Sydney seats. We only lost two seats because they were the ones that on the finest margins, and mine was one of them. Um, but um, our margins were halved in a lot of our safer seats, and that's, that's very problematic for us going into the next election. But I, there's nothing like momentum. And I have to say, um, John Howard was terribly, terribly helpful to me in the end. Uh, by about August of September, uh, he was no longer talking about anything other than himself and his own family. And everyone had been along picked that up. Uh, people would say, well, he, he would go on television. He went on, he did an interview, I think it might have been his last interview with Kerry O'Brien, uh, and where he said, well, I've consulted um, my family 
not even my party or my colleague, and, and with, along with my family, I'm deciding that I will be in this job and I may retire sometime, you know, after the next election. And, well, and everyone in Benelux said, well, if you can't be more precise than that, and if you actually can't talk about us, you know, I mean, it represented this area for 33 years, so more and more, people in Benelux, as the rest of Australia were saying, you're out of touch and you're no longer thinking about us, you're thinking about yourself, which of course is fatal with any leader. Maxine, could I ask you to reflect on uh, the decision to throw out the case against Peter Silver in the last episode? Sorry, the decision by the judge? Yes, yes. Well, I can't comment too much on the, as I say, I haven't read the full legal judgement, but I find it, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, as you know, the one can't help but think that, in fact, the government did not expect that um, judgement because, in fact, we had a, a settlement with the slipper very early on. Well, obviously, that was a settlement to do with you know, thinking calculation that you know, costs would be excessive and all the rest of it. But clearly, the judge has found that this was um, a, a, a massive abuse of process by Mr Ashby in conjunction with others who were clearly out to undermine a key figure who was critical to the survival of the government. So we're going to hear a lot more about it in the year. Actually, I was interested in your comment that you said there's a lot of very bright people in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> behaving like nuff nuffs or even worse than nuff nuffs you know that's even flattering on some days I can't watch I found this year it's almost unbearable to watch at times it is entirely different if you were to sort of land in a parliamentary office or a ministerial office or on a committee hearing let's you know that's it's been going for months on an important say trade issue or whatever if you were to kind of drop down and and just eavesdrop on those meetings. You would have an entirely different experience. Well, I have it. Yeah. I, I know, I know, and that's right. The public presentation. But right. I believe the Senate it's inquiries, mm. and I believe to uh, ministers uh, briefings, and I've sat on ministerial uh, committees, and I still say a lot of them are not looking after their own job. <laughs> well, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that is, that is your experience. Um, I don't think it, it is the norm. Um, and I suppose for all that, for all that, uh, as I say, I think we're at a, a low point in our political life. Uh, folks, it still compares very well with um, the United States, uh, the UK, uh, uh, Europe, um, a lot of Malaysian assemblies. Uh, we had a we had a group of uh, Indian. Uh, delegates out here at an Australia India conference at Melbourne University not so long ago. And these are people from academia, from politics, from business. And at the dinner on the night before, they sort of said, What is it? Why are you Australians so neurotic? What are you going to be worried about? And it's interesting, isn't it? Perspective is everything. You know, you imagine the contemporary problems in, in a, an expanding economy like India today, all the social problems and everything they have to work through, and they look at a prosperous country like Australia um, and, and say, so Why are you so neurotic? Well, we're looking in a different way, and I understand that. It's because, to say, we, we have not got a political class that is speaking the language um, and the complexity, the level of complexity that we want. Um, and that is, that is uh, uh, frustrating and infuriating many of us. But I, I, I'm sorry, I still, I stand by this. Um, uh, those who are the, 
those individuals who are there um, uh, to play games, who are self-serving, uh, who are there just to promote themselves, are few in number, but unfortunately they have all of the power. And that has certainly been the case on the Labor side in recent years. Well, look, Rudd's great mistake was not to make Tanner treasurer. Uh, had Rudd made Tanner treasurer, uh, I think he would still be in the parliament. And things could have worked out quite differently in June 2010. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What do you think about Malcolm Turnbull's future in parliament? Has he got a, is it possible that he may be a moderate political party? Well, he was asked this on Q&A, wasn't he, yeah. about the, uh, another part of the, I call this the great national fantasy at the moment, that in fact there will be a new party um, and, and come some kind of government of national unity, you know, or bringing together individuals from different sides. No, I don't think uh, uh, that is going to happen, and I don't, I think Turnbull's answer on that <coughs> should be believed. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't, um, I, I still don't think at this stage uh, that I can see any change on in the Liberal leadership between now and the next election. Um, it is perfectly true that Abbott's approval rating is low. But I have to say, on our side, we would kill for their primary vote, and their 2 PP vote is very, very strong. So what's this telling us? In spite of deep reservations about Abbott at a personal level, um, the, the electorate at the moment, and I'm hoping this changes, but certainly the electorate at the moment wants to punish the government. Well, I, again, I don't. I have, it's, again, tr it's true that the, the green vote looks to be between eight and ten percent. Wherever it's been tested, though, in the past year, um, in local government elections in uh, New South Wales, in Queensland, um, the green vote has been down. I actually think because uh, Australians have not been happy with the minority government that actually we will see a clear cut choice between the two major parties next time and that will be to the detriment of most third parties. Uh, the exception to that may be Catter's party in Queensland. And that Catter will be taking votes from the left and the right. In your view, is Julian Gillard the correct person to leave the next election? In your view? Uh, yes, I, I, I think that so much drama and disaffection has been delivered on the Australian electorate that I think, that, I mean, as I say, I'm saying this at the end of uh, a year where we're, finish, where we're finishing the year on like 34% primary vote, which is, which is pretty appalling, you know, we're losing a lot of seats from that, and we've been out for a long time. Um, I might take a different view of that vote when we go even longer, but at the moment I, I've got this feeling that there's been so much drama around this issue that perhaps any other change, people would be even more cynical about that. I, I could be wrong. Um, Just following up on that, I'm not politically minded at all, and it's probably a lot of people like you. How can we have any faith in anyone when they have teams of investigators out there trying to find every Mrs. Lena that any of them ever committed? And that's all we hear. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. There are a lot of energy, a huge amount of energy uh, in um, uh, political offices and certainly in the leaders' offices uh, and uh, among campaigners is, is, is all about dishing up the dirt on your opponents. And how one of the reasons... Well, sorry, oh, sorry. And how much of that is exaggerated by the press? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, ju I'll just finish that. Yes. that yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you read the, um, the second last chapter, of, of, of my book, um, one of the reasons that I have real problems with Sussex Street, the headquarters, Labour headquarters in New South Wales, is because I refused to run the personality-based, uh, quite frankly, defamatory campaign they wanted me to run against my opponent. Um, I wasn't going to do it I could, because I could see the, the blowback that, that would hit me. Um, and uh, someone, for instance, I, I admire enormously. Um, Anna Bly, who I think made her premiership count in Queensland, I think made a big mistake when she was persuaded to run a very negative personal campaign against Campbell Newman. And that, that resulted in, I think, an even um, lower vote uh, to, to Labor. So these, these things were abound. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I deplore it, as I say, and people are fed up with it. Why is it necessary? Uh, well, because people think, the, the, the view among the smarties is they think it works. Now, I have to say, I'll, I'll, uh, and sometimes it does. There is no doubt, I, I, I'm thrilled to bits that Barack Obama has won a second term. Thrilled to bits. Um, and what a, what a victory it was. I mean, no, he's only the second president. You have to go back to FDR to find a president who managed to get elected to a second term with unemployment as high as it is in the United States. So an amazing achievement. But there's no doubt he was able to portray his opponent, Mitt Romney, as a real captive of Wall Street and not as someone who was, you know, representative of Main Street. Street. And that was a very negative campaign they, they ran against Romney. You might say sweet justice, as we know the extreme right in the United States has been running quite a revolting campaign around some aspects of Barack Obama's background, you know, even suggesting that he's, you know, he's not American and all the rest of it. So, but that's, this is the way, you know, things are played now. Yes. Oh, no, sorry, there was a, a question from the lady there sorry, too. But I was just concerned yes. about, you know, the, the, how much does the press or the journalists or the television, everything, sort of uh, magnify this, these yes. personal All right, I'll, I'll answer both of those. Don't yeah. And just to your... Uh, look, there's certainly the, the whole, as I say, the way the, the media game is played is very, very different. Vastly different from the time when I was reporting in the early 90s. And that has to do with massive technological changes. There's now no off button. You can get news anytime, anywhere. And what does this do? This kills reflective time. I mean, journalists now sit in courtrooms or sit in, or sit in Parliament, and they are instantly tweeting out what is being said or making a comment about it. Well, what happened to thinking time? What happened to reflecting time? What happened to thinking? What happened to sort of saying, mm, is that what I really want to say here? What about judgment? You know, so everything's massively speeded up. Now, that's true. There's nothing, you know, that's a fact. My argument is the media won't change. Media, media people are followers. They're not leaders. It is up to the political class to say, we're not going to play it this way anymore. And in the last couple of pages of my book, I actually suggest something I don't think anyone's going to take any notice of. But in a world where there's, everything is available anytime, anywhere, what are we going to value? I think we'll value what is real. Um, uh, instead of someone, that, you know, now John Howard was expert at this, you know, six times a day he'd be out there talking to um, journalists about the cricket, about the weather, about you, name it. Um, and uh, that, that has been continued. I, I think actually Julia Gillard is pulling back a little bit from that, and it's a good idea. I think it'd be much better. Prime Minister of the day um, uh, is actually less available, less accessible. But when she says something, when he or she says something, you know, you might actually pause, take note. Um, Steve Brax makes this point actually that you should, the, the rule should be, you go out there and say something when you have something to say. And and this in turn, I, you know, if, you, if we get back to this point, then that, that, that we can return a bit of gravitas to uh, to the office. Uh, and in turn, I think um, journalists, one would hope, would pick up a cue from that and realise they were being treated seriously as well. Um, if you have a press conference um, in, a, in a room, um, in a political office or a parliament house, instead of in 40 degree heat under a tree or when you're on the run, journalists might actually get the idea that you're actually saying something that's serious. Um, but now, this lady's question is, why am I an optimist? Yes. yes. Why am I? Yes, why am I an optimist? Yeah. Well, optimistic. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I, I do, I have this awful feeling in my gut that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I, 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 I think we're going to kind of limp into the next election with, with both sides saying, you know, vote for us because, you know, the other person's really scary. Or, you know, she's really scarier than we are. All sort of nonsense. And there won't be much more policy there. Um, and I'll just, you know, one, one point. What could be more important than David Gonski's report on needs-based funding for our schools? God help us, we've just had, you know, the most recent international data showing that year four primary school students are number 27. In fact, the figures are so bad, I don't want to believe them. Yes. Number 27. The United States is ahead of us. And their system's a bit of a cop case at the moment. 
Now, here we are, we're finishing with that kind of international data. And we got to the end of the year with a thin piece of legislation um, about, about Gonski goals, but not a dollar attached to them. Still no agreement with the states. And that report came to the government in February of this year. Now, as we all know, the education is the thing that does define Labor governments. Gough Whitlam was defined, there are, you know, there are people around the country this, to this day who got their tertiary education because of Gough Whitlam's changes. Then again, um, uh, through the Hawke and Keating period, massively increased those uh, students who actually got to year 12 completion and, and many other things. And, and this should be the issue that, that, that badges us. Now I'm sure, I'm sure there will be movement on this in the year. But why, look at the time we were wasting on. Okay, I still haven't answered your question. Uh, why am I optimistic? <laughs> yes, I still have, yeah, yeah, why am I optimistic? Um, I guess because I believe in the I believe in the, the good sense of the place. I believe we have a lot of we have a lot of good there's a lot of solidity, there's a lot of ballast in this country. We have good institutions. Um, it's not a place that's gonna go belly up. Uh, I, I have to believe that you know, the good sense of the collective in the end will demand something better. And as I say, it's, it's whether it's in groups like this, whether it's a Q&A audience, you know, you, there is that, uh, that expectation of something better, which I think at some point will become that much more demanding. I can't be any more specific than that. And it's better, it's better than being drunk, you know. <laughs>
It's the magic question at the moment, I mean, what, is, what is the future of journalism? And the funny thing is, that the journalism schools are still packed with, with like young people like your granddaughter. They're still very eager to do these courses. Uh, and she may not be you know, politically engaged, particularly, in all the sort of things that we're talking about tonight, but she's probably interested in a whole lot of other things, like you know, development of the third world, or environmentalism, or a whole range of social issues uh, that will that she will want to write stories about. I mean, presumably she's doing journalism because she actually wants to write her stories. We all know that this will continue. We're in a great bookshop tonight because you all like to read, because you actually believe that narrative matters. This is a basic human instinct, and that's not going to change. The great question is, how is it going to be commercially viable in the future, and who the proprietors will be? There's actually now a greater diversity across the media um, but um, the people who are out there writing the blogs and, and running different websites and, and, as I say, telling their stories in very different ways aren't necessarily making a buck out of it. <laughs> they're, having to make, they're having to pay their mortgage in some other way. Uh, so this is the, what some people call um, the wild west of the new digital media age and it's not at all clear where it's going to end up. Uh, that is terrifying for some. Uh, if you're a 50 year old with a mortgage and a couple of kids still at school, that's terrifying. Uh, if you're starting out, you might be saying, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of writing the New York. Can we just we'll have one more question? Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're all here, obviously, because we're interested in what you have to say. We've taken an interest in politics, perhaps, and uh, listen to things like Question Time or Watch a Q&A. Exactly what you're talking about. 
Thank you. I've got one last question. Um, being an ex-ABC person, and, and uh, we all really, religiously watch the uh, Q and A. And then at the, at the start of the Q and A, they bring up um, the uh, Labor Party, um, the Coalition, forty-seven percent; the Labor Party, twenty-three percent; and uh, the Greens, thirty percent, or something. Do the ABC lie? That it's programmed that infuriates me for all sorts of reasons. The first one, one of them is that bloody Twitter feed. Uh, that drives me nuts. Oh, that you know, it's like a herd instinct. Uh, but here's the makeup. The makeup of the audience. I've always thought I've, when I've been on I've been on Q and A about three or four times, and I've never I've never thought I've, I've particularly done my best on that show. I think it's because the old anchor in me reasserts itself, and I, I actually want to be sitting where Tony Jones is, you know, <laughs> conducting the show. I'm thinking, Who that? You know. Um, but um, in terms of the audience, but I used to always think when I was on they fed the audience red meat, you know. Uh, it was just so, so sort of savage. It's a, oh no, it's a bizarre maker. I don't know, you have to take that up with Mark Scott. <laughs> thank you. Um, just in thanking you, so we were, uh, Di and I were fortunate enough in June 2010 to be with another ABC reporter, Geraldine Doog, and um, on that fateful night, and uh, we had a director of Santos, we had a a first secretary of the foreign affairs who was very much against Rudd because he couldn't get an ambassadorial post because of the child. Uh, he had a Down syndrome child and blamed Kevin Rudd for that. It was a most interesting mix of people, but uh, it was interesting your comments because uh, they all were thinking, oh, this is great. And Geraldine was saying it's great for television, and the, the Santos director was saying it's great for the country, and, and the first state. Um, Secretary was saying, you know, thank God he's gone. And yet when we all sat back at the end of the night and reflected it, we reflected what would this created in history and, uh, and what would the future of politics be after that decision. And it was interesting your comments that you said tonight. So uh, thank you very much for coming. And I think with the uh, participation that you've seen here, we haven't got a lot of the Labor Party here. Mel Robertson, Robertson couldn't come, so I wasn't allowed to tell any Gillard jokes tonight, so I've been gagged. But, um, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for coming to Van Sale and, and to our little shop. I think it's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And we've got you something. You were asking which are the best, uh, the best books uh, this year. Well, this one's certainly not this year. It's a, it's a few years ago. But it's a local, it's a local book on, uh, uh, called Lottie. And it's of a it's of a minister a minister but a minister of the cloth that's caused this problem. So <laughs> so we love you to uh, read that and uh, and, uh, and be interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. But um, can we all uh, thank Maxine very much for. Her time.